Welcome everybody to the College of Law and the Centre for Legal Innovations New Law Careers Summit. I'm Terry Modishead, the Executive Director of the Centre for Legal Innovation, and I'm absolutely delighted to be here as your host and facilitator today. I'm going to introduce you really briefly to our panellists because I'm going to get them to talk a little bit about their background that will provide context to what we're going to be talking about today, which is the role of a legal data analyst. And uh, I'm going to kind of go around that as I look at folks on my screen. So Steve or Steve So, um, obviously Steve is with Lander and Rogers and um, he is their head of analytics. So very well qualified to be talking about the role that we're gonna chat about today. Um, Goto Sakawa, who is an executive with Ashurst and last but certainly not least, um, Jody Baker, who is the founder and CEO of Zakia Technologies. Um, so folks, welcome. Really good to see you all. Hi, really good to, uh, to have you here. So with all of that having been said, folks, um, would love to kind of jump in and, and hear all about you, hear your story. So I guess, why did you choose to get into the role of a legal data analyst? And uh, how did that kind of emerge from your own personal backgrounds? And Jody, I'm going to kick off with you on that one. Thanks, Terry. It's great to be here. And uh, hello to everybody who is enthusiastically attending to hear about legal data analytics. Uh, I guess my story is uh, maybe not one so much of choosing legal data analytics, but one that evolved for me. Uh, I don't know if anybody has watched the Steve Jobs Connect the Dots uh, Stanford University commencement speech, but recommend it as, as something that you can do to understand how sometimes your career evolves in ways you don't expect. My background is as a lawyer. I was a lawyer at Minter Ellison uh, and then an in-house lawyer at what was then Australia's largest stockbroking firm, JB Weir and Son, uh, which was later acquired by Goldman Sachs and was there through the Goldman Sachs era and on the Goldman Sachs part of the, the business after I left the law and became an equities or a financial analyst and spent much of my day dealing with financials and Excel spreadsheets and charts and all sorts of things that were about trying to communicate an idea to our uh, intended audience who were investors and really understand how to make an idea or a concept into a visual uh, picture, if you like, so that you could communicate something quite different. Um, after I came back into the legal industry, which was as the uh, one of the founding uh, partners of the law firm Hive Legal, um, really it was about entering into the Zakia space, so kicking off the, the legal technology business that I now run, uh, I was bringing together those two parts of my, my career. So the legal career and the, uh, and the, the data analytics component, uh, and those two things came together in the software. Not necessarily in an obvious way to start with, but I think that um, you've got an option always through your career about how you communicate things, how you communicate any idea that you have, any message that you need to deliver, any problem that you might need to solve. And data analytics increasingly is the form of communication that we are turning to as a generation and as an industry, I think. So for me, it wasn't so much a, I want to be a legal data analyst, more just that I had the legal and I had the data and those two things came together in my, uh, in my business venture. Perfect storm and a perfect opportunity, I guess, right? Yes, yes, I guess so. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jody. Got to tell us about you and your story. Hi. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Yes, my name is Gotto Skull and I work at Ashra's Risk Advisory. Um, similar to Jody, it wasn't something that I actively chose in terms of a, a legal data analyst. It's something that I, I would say almost was very fortunate to, to fall into. Um, in terms of the training that I got, I'm actually a, a trained engineer, um, started a lot of the, the numbers and being able to communicate those types of things and really started getting interested in to the data space and quite fortunate enough to, to land a job in one of the big four consultancy firms, um, especially, sorry, specifically around um, the data analytics team there as well. Um, and so I spent a lot of my time there, hands on the tools, um, looking at things like SQL and a bit too much time on Excel perhaps. Um, and then as I kind of grew, grew into that role, started to understand how not only is there a technical perspective around data, but there's also a huge element around how organizations themselves use information and something that we call enterprise data management. Um, and that really kind of opened up my eyes as to how broad data is within the, I guess, how organizations can use data. Um, 
and also gave me an understanding how you got something so granular like a data point um, and seeing it essentially travel all the way through to an exec level or board level in order to inform their decision making capabilities as well. So I was able to get a good foundation there at um, one of the big four consultancies. Um, and then one of, the, one of my really good colleagues is actually um, quite innovatively moves over to Asher. So we're trying to create a new consultancy practice within the law firm. Um, and one of the key capabilities that we wanted to, to grow out was within the data analytics space that also service the law firm. And so I was able to have that opportunity to, to move over um, and now be able to use my skills within um, data and also help serve a lot of the lawyers, helping them to understand the impact a particular litigation issue or a particular breach might be involved in um, and helping their clients also to understand those issues. And so that's where I spend a lot of my time these days, um, trying to essentially still keep the hands on the tools, but also be able to communicate to lawyers how data can be used and essentially try to break down complex legal problems um, in a tech, tech lens. So, Goro, you know I'm going to come to you about a question about how legal is different from other industries and those tools, but I'm saving it. I'm going to come back to it in a second because I want to move to Steve first and ask you, Steve, to tell us a bit about your background and story as well. Um, it's, it's so exciting. So, hi to everyone that's on, on this uh, webinar today. It, it's, it's funny because only it's, you know, when when we became legal data analysts, this job didn't really exist uh, only just as a far back as a few years ago. But just hearing now there's a dedicated session for it, there's a lot of momentum behind it. It's it's very exciting to see. So like both uh, Goto and, and, and Jody did not start out in this area. Um, I myself like Goto is uh, an engineer by training who kind of just fell into this, this world, right? So started off my uh, started off in the world of operations running big legal operate uh, sorry not legal uh, operations teams and that required like a huge dependency on numbers and data like how are we doing what's happening what's the downtime like all the data fact uh, like backed stats on what you actually need to do to run the business and like from there um, also went into consultancy so looked at like the management of companies how they operate, understanding the data behind them, using like data to actually show how well we were doing or how well we weren't doing in, in an operational standpoint. Because, uh, because we had to really like absorb, live and die by the, the information, uh, when you know, I had made some personal changes, got dragged down to Australia by my partner and uh, stuck here for the last COVID years. Um, you know, been fortunate enough to, to land at, at Lander and Rogers. And, and it, it was different, right? In the legal space, there's so much information that's captured, but so little of it is actually being like, you know, wrung out for insights uh, beyond, beyond a financial sense. There's a huge, like huge, huge intellectual capital that, you know, that law firms, in-house counsel, like that the legal industry sits on. And it's just, you know, we're just starting to turn up that dial a little bit by little bit to actually see what we can actually uncover. So it's really promising to see like, you know, there's, you know, there's um, to tools like Zakia and, you know, like you know, dedicated uh, positions like Goto is doing to actually mine this information a little bit more and to bring it up to that executive level to help them make decisions. It's such an opportunity to I guess, grow in the sort of roles that you occupy and other roles that will no doubt grow out of that as well. So um, lots of potential opportunity there. Folks, I wanted to um, address the next question in terms of digging a little bit deeper into your role and truly understanding it. From your intros, each of you are working with data, obviously, but it seems to be that it might be different data and it might also be working in a slightly different way. So let me go to you, first of all, Goto, and ask you, what's involved in your role kind of more specifically, or I guess looking at it another, another way, what does your day-to-day -day look like? Day-to-day, -day, yeah. It's, um, as a consultant, it's really determined by the different types of clients that we're servicing at the time, which kind of makes it so exciting at, at the same time, right? Because you're getting to not only work with different people from different clients, but also that means you're working with different types of data sets as well as different types of tools. 
And so it makes our role exciting in a way that you need to be very flexible and you also need to have the ability to upskill technically pretty quickly as well. Um, and it also depends on the, I guess, the stage of the engagement you're on. Sometimes we work on six month engagements to one year engagements. So, you know, the first three months is going to look very different to the, to the last three months, right? Um, but I think at the core of it, what, what I would be doing on a day-to-day -day basis is we all know that the information systems and the data we can get out of that, it's hard numbers and hard facts, but there's also a lot of subjective interpretations that's required in order to make use out of those, that information. And so every, I guess, manipulation or every transformation or interpretation that we do, especially when it comes to a breach report or some sort of litigation issue, everything needs to be checked by a lawyer. And so a lot of the business rules that we apply to this type of information is us communicating with the lawyers as well as to the business or to the client to make sure that they're happy with the type of, I guess, action that's being done. And eventually that goes into a final outcome or a final calculation in terms of what we can provide to the client as to how bad the impact is or how good the impact might be. Um, but it's really how we communicate with the business and the lawyers um, that really drives what we do as data analysts on a on a day to day basis. But that seems also got to, to be quite a collaborative role. So you're working kind of side by Absolutely. side with the lawyers, and I imagine others in in much more of a multidisciplinary team environment, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think being able to work with different teams is a major issue, and uh, sorry, a major a major positive, I should say. Um, but also an issue in terms of you know lawyers know exactly what they're doing when it comes to the law side of things, but they're not expected to know how technology, how information systems, how data manipulation works. And so it's our job to not only be able to do that work, but also be able to translate that into a, a digestible format for the lawyers, as well as to the client as well, um, so that we are all on the same page. And then that, you know, the engagement or the project that we're on is moving forwards in the way that it should be, rather than people overcomplicating particular problem statements or solutions um, as well. So yeah, it's, a, it's definitely collaborative in terms of the way we work. And Jody, I'm gonna to come to you particularly on this, but I just wanna ask this of you as well, Goto, if I may. It sounds also that identifying the right tech to use so that it can produce the data that you can then, and the tools effectively to use to be able to collaborate is also an important part of your job. Is that a fair comment as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, given the, the sensitive nature of the work that we do, a lot of the, the work that you end up doing as a consultant as you go on to a client site, it has to be their tools that they're currently using or that they're comfortable with. And so you need to make sure that you're, you're matching that as well. Um, and that being said, if, if there isn't a, a tool of choice, there's definitely um, scope to be providing recommendations as to what they should be using. Um, but the, the tool of choice is definitely driven by what the client wants and what the client needs. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to stay in private practice world for just a second, Steve. So jumping over to you um, for the same question, what does your day-to-day -day look like if different from Godot's or the same? I think I described it quite well, but I will throw this answer out more for the not at all, uh, don't know, <laughs> uh, police. Um, I would describe my day-to-day -day as uh, in more relatable occupation. 50% um, plumber, 30% uh, cleaner, 20% artist. Now, the breakdown of that. It's great. That's a great description, I have to say. I mean, like, if you, even if you ask myself, like, what I'd be doing, you know, in a day-to-day, I, I can't really tell you because like, like uh, kind of Godos kind of said earlier, it kind of depends on what the problem or the challenge is. Do the different data sets, the different things that you're looking at are going to be varied. So it keeps it exciting, but also keeps you on your toes, right? Um, so that 50% plumber is I'm scrambling around trying to figure out where the bloody leak is, where the mm. data is supposed to be coming from, how to connect it together, how to join two and two together, mm. and why that actually even makes sense. Why would people be looking at this data set with this data set? And, and, um, and like, if it's not there, 
you know, does it, is there a system that captures it? If it doesn't say, capture a house, are you going to get it? Like where, where, where's that information set going to come from? Right. And that's half the problem is just going around lo looking through the walls and looking at, Hey, where's, where's that, where's that source? 30% cleaner. Now, now these are very not glamorous jobs and this is not what you study uh, <laughs> an advanced degree to do, but then you, then you, then you, then the information comes in and it's just muddy, right? And, and so you have to look at how, how to actually sieve and clean the data to make sure that it is in a usable state and it, you know, it's not too old, it's not too, uh, not too fresh. Like, so there's a various factors depending on what it is that you're trying to solve for to put that all together. And you know, my personal favorite is the last part, but, uh, but can vary for depending on who you are, but it's, it's the artist, right? So looking at, well, now that you have this really cool set of information and, and data, what's the insight? Where are you trying to learn from this information that's, uh, and make this come alive? How you tell a story uh, through a visual way on what that information means? Because you have a lot of data, you, you have a lot of data points, and how do you actually illustrate that to mean make something meaningful? Mm -hmm. And especially when you look at some of our more senior um, senior management uh, teams, right? They're looking at how to dispel a lot of that big, big chunks of information that they don't want to actually go through the nitty gritty of it, tell a simple, understandable story that then they can actually make an actual, an actionable difference on it and mm -hmm. move to it, right? And that's, that's the real power of, of having good data is to be able to say, hey, there's something that this is telling you here. You need to do A, B, C because of it. Yeah, absolutely. Jody, the fascinating part, there are many of them, about your career has been that you're almost um, building the bridge in a way from private practice in-house and and back again. So you, you've gone through the process of actually building the tool um, that can produce the data that could actually be useful in the way that Gotto and, and Steve have both uh, spoken to. So, so tell us a little bit more about that and I guess your day-to-day -day as well. Yeah, so I, I really loved the, the plumber, uh, cleaner and artist analogy. And I would probably add there too, Steve, architect at the very front end. So um, a big part of what we do is understanding the client need up front because we're building a tool that has to go across a very wide user base as opposed to an individual consulting arrangement. So uh, we spend a lot of time just talking to clients and understanding what are the pain points that they have around communicating or understanding their own business, understanding what they do, who they're doing it for, what sort of work it is, that you know, turnaround times, all sorts of things that can be measured in data, but understanding how they want that communicated and then architecting that up front and then going into the, the second phase of, um, of then building and what have you, um, which I think is you know, probably one of the most important parts for us is making sure that we understand that problem set right from the get-go, because if we get halfway through the build, then you know, we, we hit all sorts of issues at that point. Our day-to-day, -day, um, or my day-to-day, -day, I should say us, because I'm not the only person who works in the data analytics component at Zakia, but um, for those who don't know, Zakia is an in-house legal software. So we're dealing with in-house lawyers, in-house legal departments. Um, so they are the service providers to their organisation in, um, in the legal sphere. Uh, so they, they work both directly for their internal clients and they're providing legal advice there. They're also working with their law firms and engaging their law firms on pieces of work that they can't or don't want to manage internally. So there are a number of different facets to the work that they're doing and the sort of data that they need to collect accordingly. Um, so we spend a lot of time talking to clients, understanding what they're doing. Uh, and then of course we have to work, I have to work directly with our technical guys I come from a, I uh, did an arts uh, law degree, political science major, didn't have any sort of technical expertise whatsoever. I'm not an engineer by training. So for me, uh, it was about understanding that problem set and then um, having to learn all of the, the sort of technical components that go behind that. So I work with our database guys. We don't have a SQL database. We have an event source database. So it's a very different sort of structure, understanding how that data is collected, what it looks like, how we can manipulate it, what the power of that is. Um, and once I have my arms wrapped around that, then how we surface that data 
and go to the artist piece around making sure that we are uh, visualising that in a way that lawyers who naturally have an allergic reaction to an Excel spreadsheet and everything that um, <laughs> feels like numbers and data and what have you, you know, we have to make sure that that data gets to, you know, get carried over the bridge, if you like, and, and into the hands of the, the general counsel, associate general counsel, who feel comfortable with it, understand the message or the, the um, information that it's providing them so that they are empowered to then share that information with their executives or board or other members of the legal team. So it's a it's a, an end-to-end communication, if you like, uh, and taking all of those things that Stephen Goddard talked about completely under the hood so that the lawyers collect the data throughout the course of their day um, in almost a seamless manner. They don't even know that they're collecting data and then you know, provide them with the reports in a way that they can actually use it to communicate the key message both to themselves and to their uh, internal stakeholders. But Jodie, a part of that, that, that I'm drawing out of what you're saying is also just the critical part in the, in the artist part of understanding who your audience is so that what you're constructing, particularly in the work that you do, but, but I imagine the work that all of you are doing, um, is really to create something that is meaningful and user-friendly to whoever's going to be receiving it. And that might be slightly different depending on who you're producing the information for. Yeah, and and Terry, maybe to put it into an actual example, often a general counsel will feel like they're really busy. Our our team is really busy. We need extra lawyers. Um, Sure, your intuition is probably right, but what does that really mean? Are you 10% busier this this year than last year? Are you 50% busier? Are you busier in contract work? Are you busier in litigation? What sort of a lawyer should you go and employ? If you don't have data around that, you might go and employ a junior IP lawyer when in actual fact you needed a senior litigation lawyer. Or you might go and employ somebody to deal with something that feels huge, but actually it's related to a part of the business you're about to um, sell. You know, there are all sorts of things about data that will inform business decisions about how you operate. uh, And you need to be able to visualise that. So we have a whole lot of different data visualisations, but one might be actually just tracking pure volume of work so that you can make a business case to say we're doing x percent more work this year than we were last year therefore we need five more lawyers in our legal team Mm -hmm. Um, without that data you are going and making a business case based on gee we're just really busy and data speaks volumes and allows for the business case in a far more convincing manner that then leads to a better outcome for everybody so, so a critical part of what you're all involved in too sounds to me like developing those KPIs or metrics that, that you can use in the business context and I imagine in client matters as well. Is, is that a fair comment as well? Your, your king, to to talk. King, <laughs> kings and queens of metrics, is that, is that a fair comment? We, we definitely have key metrics that we work yeah. towards. Uh, so there are probably... 10 metrics that we think are critical to running a legal department, but often organisations have their own metrics already in place. Um, But that's part of that architecting piece, understanding where the consistencies are. We have a global client base. And so we have to understand what are individual um, regional nuances and what are global uh, consistencies. And we work towards the consistent uh, metrics that everybody wants to see. Steve, Gotto, anything that you'd like to add to that? I was just going to say, I was adding architect to the, uh, <laughs> the, the three personalities that, that you need to have. Um, a four personality. Go four, four, four personality. personality. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's right. Um, so, so, so metrics are definitely important. I think one of the things that, that, I, that we, I find with analytics is, yes, metrics are definitely important, but it's, it's precision, I think, that, uh, that Jody was speaking to as well. Because... When I talk to like very good experienced operators and very good experienced professionals, although they it is a little bit of a finger in the air that we're busy and that you know we need this or the business case can support like this like you know this, they're not that far off. But it's just helping with back with information. Is it one or one point two? Is it like three or is it you know is it is it what's the precision behind it and how can we actually slice that information a little bit differently so you can actually paint and understand um, that the resource need is a lot of times that what we get the, the, the load of files that we have the where the hours slip in the day so it's having that precision that's that really you're enabling the business to understand it better and obviously improve things like efficiency and effectiveness as well, right? It's a, a critical factor. 
Um, I, I want to move into the next one and actually pick up some of the questions that we've got coming up uh, as well. Uh, and that is to get into the nitty gritties of this thing around skills and knowledge and capabilities. And given that each of you have come to your role slightly differently, um, I'm, I'm assuming your answers may be similar or different to this question as well. So I'll start with the first one. Is it necessary to be a league to be a legal data analyst? And I'm putting the emphasis on the legal bit here um, for you to have completed a law degree or worked in a law firm. So, do you need the do you need to understand the industry and or do you need to have come from? I guess, the advice part of the industry in order to be able to work in the role. And Jody, I'm going to jump to you first on that one. My answer is a definitive no. I think that there's a little bit of um, a dependency in that based on what the data analytics is. If you're deep into litigation outcomes, possibly you, you need to understand um, litigation and litigation processes a little, but no, I think that data is data is data. You have to be a great communicator and that means a great listener and learner and have the curiosity to really absorb what your clients are needing to communicate and then you have to be able to act as the bridge between their needs and the output at the other end, which is the, the data to be communicated or the outcome to be communicated. Um, but I think that legal is not fundamentally different to any other vertical. Uh, it's just a, a question of people needing to have the curiosity to understand it. Thank you. So Goddard and Steve, I'm gonna ask you this question. This is very specifically the question that's been posed and you'll love it. Is a Bachelor of Science Engineering required for being a legal data analyst? So let me ask that question of you first, Steve. No, no, not <laughs> although although going to go and I are do share engineering backgrounds. Yeah. I would say this a STEM STEM degree does does probably help you and orientate you in the right path for uh, data analysts. Um, but I wouldn't say that that is a minimum or a requirement as a part of that entry into that field. I I look at I look at the best people that that I've worked with um, that are data analysts. And the key feature they bring to the table is, is curiosity and willing to dig in a bit more. So when you see like a loose thread and that's hanging, that's hanging by your data, I need someone that's going to pull and pull and pull and pull and, and unwrap the fundamental, like understanding the issue behind that, that, that problem. And if that's, you know, with, with a bit of a jump start with a, like a STEM degree, that's great. If that's if you're starting in a different place, it kind of depends on the maturity of the organization as well. So um, there'll be different expectations for large organizations versus kind of smaller ones. My my thing is someone that's curious, willing to learn, and then like dig and dig and dig. But what are your thoughts on that? I totally agree with Steve. I think having a STEM background is definitely going to give you a nice foundation. Um, but I think it's the curiosity side that Steve mentioned that's really going to get you over the line in being able to build those particular skills that you need um, or require from a, a legal data analyst perspective as well. So, yeah, I think Steve hit the nail on the head there. So let me, let me dig a little bit more into those common skills and capabilities. I guess I've heard from you things like design, really important to be able to bring that or user experience into it. We've heard communication and collaboration, communication particularly a lot. Um, you know, that seems to have come through very specifically. But Goto, you referred to earlier um, tools and we've, we've heard Excel um, mentioned. Are there other tools that come immediately to mind that if folks were thinking about developing some capabilities um, to help them, to ease them, if you like, into this sort of role that you would recommend that they think about. And, I'm, and I want to come to each of you, Steve and Jody, on this as well. But Goto, if I may start with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the first thing I would say is even just based on everyone on the panel right now, you can really see how broad this particular area is. And so I don't want to say these tools and just say, you know, you need to know these tools in order to go into these like particular roles. I think it's, it's so broad. Um, but in terms of recruitment with, within our team right now, um, I think 
we don't really expect everyone to be very competent in every single tool out there, right? It's, it's, a, it's a broad range of tools that you need to be learning if you were to do that. Um, but I think having bread and, what we call bread and butter skills really kind of helps facilitate and help give us comfort that you know what you're talking about when it comes to data manipulation and what it means to be as a, as a data analyst. Um, and so usually we, we provide questions around, obviously Excel is a very fundamental thing, but we also look at, you know, SQL databases. Can you code in that particular language? Python R is also a pretty good language to learn, especially if you're starting off in this space. Um, and also being familiar with the visualization tools as well, um, such as Power BI and, and Tableau. They're the main ones that we kind of look and see how competent you are in those particular skills and there are other ones out there when you start to look at you know, big data platforms and all those particular languages that require that um, mm -hmm. especially within cloud technologies but it's i think those are the areas um, that we we tend to look at when it comes to specific hard skills yeah and you could come to those without having for example your background you could come to those and learn them relatively easily well, well, that's right. I think that's what Steve was trying to get out earlier as, mm. as well, where it's the way of thinking that really helps you, the foundational, I guess, way to, to map a particular problem. Um, but all these, all those tools that I just mentioned, there's a lot of resources on the internet right now for you to be able to pick up and, and learn even from this afternoon, right? So mm. I think, yeah, it's, um, they're all very transitionable, pick upable skills, if that's a word. Um, <laughs> we'll go with it <laughs> we'll go with it yeah yeah um but yeah i hope that kind of answers the questions as to what the 101 in data analytics is yeah it does and, and again i'm kind of focusing on the folks that have an interest in getting into this but may not know where to kind of start where to start pulling out the tools that they could perhaps jump into but god has also provided a great segue to you steve so thoughts on tools or, or any of those common skills or capabilities or knowledge we might have missed? I think he covered it uh, for some of the big tools to be using. Uh, I think that's, yeah, I think, I think he's got it covered. Maybe I'll, I'll just deal with it in a bit of uh, classification buckets. Um, so although I, I talked about digging, 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 one is to understand and explore and be able to load that the data and, and, and and, and cleanse it. So that, that's kind of like one, one part of it. Two is to be able to do some analysis behind it. So understanding the relationships with the data, what's um, you know, a little bit of statistics behind it. And then th the third part is that presentation layer to be able to communicate that information to a wider audience. Now, I would say, you know, to be a legal data analyst, you don't have to be a master of all three you don't even have to be a master of two, depending on like, again, the size and scale of the, of the, of the organization you might be looking to work with. Uh, you know, you might need to know relatively, like uh, be a generalist across all three, or you may be expected to know really, really deeply into each one of those. So it'll depend, uh, it'll depend a little bit of, on one, your interest and your kind of passion, and then two, matching the rights. Um, outfit that that kind of can cater to that passion. But those are kind of the large three buckets, which, you know, Goto's kind of talked about as well, right? So, you know, having Excel, uh, SQL, Python, or R um, is, is kind of important to that beginning part. And then that Power BI and Tableau for kind of the presentation part, as well as, the, and then as on, on top of all that stuff is, is then to be able to communicate that well, because I've seen a lot of really, really excellent data analysts that really, really can dig in and find that thread. But if you don't know how to tell the story behind what all this stuff means or put it all together and, and summarize that, um, that that's also a, a required skill that we would, we would need to help you elevate the data into something that you can use. Thank you first, Steve. Jody, can I just oh, please, sorry. please, no, go ahead. ahead one more yeah. comment in relation to all of that. So for those people who might be listening who are not, who are thinking about legal data analytics, not as a technical role, but actually um, that they're interested in data, they're interested in how 
they can have that in their career, but not necessarily be a technical person and, and learning coding languages and all of those sorts of things. Um, at the tail end of that legal data analytic, the technical legal data analytics roles that Stephen Goddard were talking about is the action. And so taking all of that grunt work that's been done, the communication that has come to you, and then being able to say, I have all of this data at my fingertips, what am I going to do with it? Um, that's actually, that's a role too. And it might be just part of a role, particularly if you're coming at this as a, a law student who's looking at it and thinking, I don't know how to code and that's all too overwhelming, but I actually really love looking at interesting data and looking at what it can tell me. Having people do the technical piece and then being able to utilize that in a meaningful way, understand it and utilize it and put it into action points is also part of a role. It may not be you know, the whole of a role in, in a legal career, it may not be um, even, you know, something that you do every single day, but it is a skill set that is definitely required uh, in the, the next era, I think, as legal data analytics really comes to the fore in, um, in both private practice and in-house teams. Jodie, it's a perfect segue to one of the questions that we've got, so I'm going to pose that one here. And it's someone that's, that's kind of looking at this, as we know, with a lot of the new law careers, that we're looking at today and tomorrow, there's not um, a standard or there's not a, a course that you can go to, if you like, to learn how to do this role. It's kind of a, there's bits of it in a whole bunch of different places and, and your response has got to, and Steve kind of um, speak to that, I guess, in terms of this role. But the question to all of you is this, do you think that we are yet at a point or likely to be soon where there would be a dedicated postgraduate qualification in legal data analytics. What are your thoughts on that? And, and anyone feel free to jump in here. Or, or no one is the case, maybe. <laughs> let, let, me, let me ask that question of oh. you first, Jodie, because you were getting there. You were kind of heading in that direction. Um, I, I can see it more as a subject than as a course, I think, Terry. Um, yeah. I think that there, back to your question about do you need to have a law degree to, to go into legal data analytics and me saying definitively, I think the answer is no, you need to be a data analytics person with the right level of curiosity to understand legal. And then Stephen got have said the opposite, you need to be um, somebody who has the curiosity to learn the data analytics side. I think that there's a broad range of skills that are required here. You just have to have, you know, some, some, some good qualifications and a good level of curiosity to, to come and play in this space. Um, my feeling is that you possibly need the, the industry to grow, um, to be quite deep rather than broad. And the depth that Goddard was talking about with each client will determine the consulting engagement um, means that you could be really, really deep on, on a litigation um, or a you know, regulatory risk or whatever it might be. And then that takes you a year and then you move on to the next thing. And by the time you come back to regulatory risk, it could be five years later. Um, mm. And so you're not necessarily doing those things in a repeat fashion. Um, I think that data analytics in the legal space needs to get a lot broader um, and deeper before we can see a place for, for a dedicated course around this space. But a subject... 100%. There's an yeah. awful lot that you could communicate in a, a subject in a law degree or in a postgrad degree, for sure. Yeah, pr probably even more in an undergrad degree. Steve, I know that you want to respond to that, but I want to add a little twist to it as well, just building on from what Jodie was saying. Does it mean that we're going to stay more generalist for a while at the moment in this career, but there will be specialisms? To me? Or to you, Steve, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think so. Like, I, I think at the point of where we're at in the market is, I think it's it's going to be a little bit more generalist. I'm I'm sure in different markets, like in the UK or the US, I'm I, I'm pretty sure they're starting to look into those spe specialisms uh, so far. But I think uh, in the market today, I would see it's just as a as a generalist. Um, which would not to say that the universities aren't already starting to think down this path. So we did have some consultation, consultation sessions with uh, one of the Australian universities that have been looking into, again, not, not, a, not a full full degree, but you know, some certificates and diplomas on this very subject. Mm. Um, so the universities are getting ahead of it. They can see the momentum 
based on the you know the audience here today that's that's interested um there definitely is moving towards that that way um but uh to like coming up soon yeah absolutely i, I want to stay in the future for a second and got to ask you this question because we haven't touched on it quite as much yet but we probably see a lot um, in the media probably a lot more in the media about it than we're seeing necessarily in the industry but um, do you think that the area of predictive analytics is a growth area in this kind of more general or broader sense of legal data analytics and and if so where do you see that raising its head and a, maybe a specialism in that as well that's a, it's a great question quite interesting trying to predict whether predictive analytics is going to be <laughs> the next big thing and I, I think the bottom answer you, you you've got to say yeah it's, it's going to be and it's starting to be a massive area within the industry um i think a lot of the predictive analytics that have come in the past it's been very numbers based and now we're starting to get access to technologies such as NLP, where you can start to churn through a lot of unstructured information and start to cluster it and making it more insightful rather than, than having, a, say, one legal data analyst manually going through it. And within our practice, for example, we've definitely found um, use cases on where we can be using not just predictive analytics, but also robotic process automation and all these different other types of new age data analytics capabilities as well. Um, and I think judging by what the market is saying as well, that there are teams within other law organizations that are starting to, I guess, grow these types of capabilities and practices as well. So I'll definitely yeah, say it's, a, it's going to be a pretty exciting area in the, in the years to come. You've also Can touched that. Yeah, please go ahead, Steve. Kind of that, that, so although I think it's 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 funny, I'm gonna watch go to write the prediction algorithm to see if predicting. <laughs> um, we're just getting to a point where we're actually starting to track a lot more of that information and making it available. The chicken and egg to this is that you need a lot of information, you need a lot of data, you need a lot of openly sourceable results before you can actually start to apply some of that uh, data analysis to it. So you have clean data, you have information, then you can analyze it, and then you can really start to get into like that future realm of, of uh, predictive. And I, I, I don't know about my, my peers, but I would just say we're just, you know, we're starting to collect good data now. Um, and then very soon, maybe a little bit later down the track, then we'll have, we'll be able to have that space of predictive later. Steve, I want to stay with you for a second and pick up one of the questions here, which is a great question. And that is, um, how does the data come to a data analyst? So what form does it come in? And the example is given, is it a table? Is it numbers? I mean, what is this stuff that you're actually analysing? I guess I'm, I'm paraphrasing that there. Uh, geez, I'd be a little bit afraid to answer because I'm <laughs> saying... <laughs> <laughs> it can come from like from our some of our um, more senior practitioners on you know still on a piece of paper to post-it um, notes, yeah, post-it post notes. notes, yeah, yeah. Uh, all the way to more sophisticated. So yeah, maybe like anywhere from kind of manual sources to you know spreadsheets like a, like a table like the like the uh, your question was asking um to more sophisticated data points which are inside your inside your main enterprise systems mm. and you can plug directly into that to get that information so um sometimes most of the times it's a mix of all of the above um but it's yeah it, it comes from all over the place and it can be structured or unstructured or big or small i guess is all that there's variations on that is it fair to say that it's information in a whole bunch of sources, but the work that you do is taking that information and ordering it and sorting it in a way that you can tell a story? I know that's very simplistic, but is that is that a fair thing or what bits am I missing from that? And, and that's where I like how Jody's added the architect to it, right? So before we actually dive into that information, what 
what is it that we're actually looking to understand out of that information before we start plugging everything in, right? Mm. So it's really understanding the purpose of that uh, of that data, and then and then plumbing it all together to to see if there's anything that comes out of it. Fantastic. And I just want to say, Jody, go to any any uh, additional comments on that because it gets to the the core or the nub of what you do, I guess, as well. Yeah. So for us, the the data is surfaced in the software so it's you know we it is our job as the software providers to actually collate and um churn that data in the background and to some extent the the cleansing is uh is part of that exercise and so it all happens under the hood as part of our database and mm. surfacing it into the report so um the analysis the legal data analyst piece uh, is is sort of done before you get to the communication piece and uh, the communication then has to almost make that analyst piece intuitive for the user. They have to be able to pick up a report that gets tuned out of Zakia and say, oh, okay, now I can see that this is the outcome that I'm looking for. And to, to sort of circle that back into the predictive analytics question that you asked earlier, Terry, mm. there are two major issues that our clients are dealing with. One is resource management. So where do I put my resources so that I extract the greatest value from them um, and understanding that resource allocation and resource optimization. Uh, so getting into the predictive realm of how do I, I know this is the type of work that I have, how can I manage those resources to extract the greatest value from that, whether it be law firms or internal legal team members or what have you. Um, and the other is risk management. So making sure that you are um, identifying risk, red flags, all of those sorts of things. So being able to, using our um, particular type of database, being able to create that notion of, oh, we've seen this before, um, mm. and that tells us that we are going to see low risk or high risk around this set of data. Uh, so being able to say, you know, this is a matter that started off very small and insignificant before, but it comes from a part of the business and these circumstances around it that tell us it's a red flag and we need to start managing our risk differently here. Um, so those sorts of predictive pieces allow for the, the management of a legal department in both resource optimization and risk management. Yeah, to me, it, it, it almost has the promise or possibility in, in respect of risk, at least, of um, changing us from being reactive as lawyers, um, but being proactive. And I guess we've seen that in the in the medical industry that has used data to help them do that. It's a, it's a real game changer, I think, in terms of that, if, if nothing else. Um, but necessary, oh, actually, Terry, because the risks yeah. are only increasing. It's becoming exponential. You Absolutely. add, you know, every regulatory change, a war in the Ukraine, a pandemic, you know, these things are big and global now in a way that they weren't before you know go back 20 30 years um, a lot of things were far more localized and the the exponential risk attached to some of these things is much harder for small legal departments i'm thinking obviously about my client base but for small sure. legal departments to be managing these huge global issues uh, you need to be on the front foot with them but also speaks to the critical role that this role plays um, as well in terms of the decision making and and interpretation of all of those things as well. Steve, did you want to add a few comments to that? I was going to say, like to Jody's points, we may think, even as small uh, companies, may, we may think we're quite insular, but the data is, the expectations of our clients are on a way, way different level now, right? So yes, understanding that data, having like insight into what you're doing, how like, you know, how other things like war in Ukraine start to factor into your delivery costs or supply chain costs or like you know things we used to think like you know it's, it's a little bit protected as legal advisors but not anymore especially as we kind of come closer to our clients our clients are more data literate um you know we ourselves have to up the game building on that steve and jody picking up a question that's directed to you here because it's kind of direct segue is how do you influence clients on the importance, importance of data management systems, particularly where they may not have the funds or they're reluctant to invest in those sort of technologies? So, and one of the other things I'm gonna say is influencing skills may also be an important part of the role, but over to you on that one. So, I, I mean, I guess the first thing is that we, um, we, we work with our clients because they're using our software, which is the, the means of capturing the data. Uh, the conversation is often around 
you have to spend the money so that you can save the money. Um, you have to spend a small amount of money so that you can get the return in terms of uh, more intelligent decisions. Uh, you wouldn't go into a, a law case in a courtroom without evidence. You don't go and you don't make business decisions without having the data to back up those business decisions. So for us, it's it's probably the influencing piece is probably more in the front end in the sales process than it is in the after the event piece. That said, um, we have an entire um, customer success and, and analytics um, department that will work with our existing clients so that they're leveraging the information that they have to make the most sensible decisions um, that they can possibly make uh, and understanding what that data looks like. Allergic reactions to data doesn't just come in the form of an Excel spreadsheet. Um, sometimes these reports come out and, you know, there's an awful lot of information there. They've been collecting data and, and there's a lot that they can do with it. Um, you'd be surprised how many of our clients, you know, want to use this much of it when it's, you know, this much that they could use. So uh, some of that's just training. It's an industry um, exercise in making sure that everybody's educated about what the legal data is, how things should be measured, how we all talk to each other. Um, that's the role of the Centre for Legal Innovation to some extent amongst others who uh, make sure that this is part of the conversation and we all influence each other. It's not just Zakia and talking to our clients, it's a rising tide lifts all ships so that we all get, uh, get the most out of the uh, legal data analytics conversation. And, and, and maybe harking back to some of those things that we've mentioned about the case studies and the metrics as well, right, Having pulling those out. Steve, thoughts on that? Uh, maybe less appropriate, but data's <laughs> like a drug. You know, as soon as you give them a taste, you know, they'll want a little bit more and more and more and try to understand uh, their, their inside a bit more. So... You just, you just you start simple, right? Um, it, you they may not have the right enterprise systems. You may not, may not have you know all the things that established in an ideal world, but you just get them to start just tracking some of their simple information again from what do you want to know? What do you want? To, what kind of problem business problem are you trying to solve? Start getting them tracking around that uh, that first steps of simple data analysis, and then once they get a taste, understand how the insights behind it can really affect their business outcome, um, they're hooked. Yeah, absolutely. We've got um, a, a question on metrics there, but I'm, I'm going to, if I may, refer folks to some of your publications, Jody, because I know you've done some work in this area and those publications are available free from your website around metrics. And there's been some stuff done by Clock and others in the legal ops area that would be um, helpful as well. Uh, Godo, I wanted to come to you with this question. It's a great one, and I'm going to pose it to all of you. And that is, what do you find the most enjoyable thing is about being a legal data analyst? It's a great question, isn't it? What do you love about your job, I guess? It really is. Um, I think in a nutshell, it's just going to be the fact that I have both sides of the spectrum where I can be technical, I can be in the in the weeds, but the most important part of my role is actually being able to communicate those ideas and how I've done things to senior stakeholders, right? So I think it's that collaboration and the communication piece that actually drives me and I get, kind of get energy from doing that. And I think that's what I really enjoy doing. Yeah. People bit. Sounds like the people bit is what gets you energised, right? Yeah, even though I'm speaking to an Excel spreadsheet all day. <laughs> Go figure. Fantastic. Steve, what are your thoughts on that? What do you love about your job? Uh, I don't know. So many things <laughs> I love, I hate about it. <laughs> Share as you feel appropriate. <laughs> well, okay. So I, I want to give our audience like both the good and the bad, right? Sure, so, sure. You know, I, I know originally before when we were meeting, we said we need to like you know, we need more data analysts, not, not repel them away. Yes. Um, but the, <laughs> the good does to follow with like, yeah, being able to see and have people understand the information and, and, the, and the data in a new way, right? Mm -hmm. It's not this mess of tables. It's not this like, you know, dump of, of, a, of a system that, that, that doesn't really, or like, you know, old, old reports that don't really tell, tell a meaningful st story to them help them understand and rise above the kind of the, the data that's that's there and have them understand 
the information on a higher level and to be able to have a meaningful outcome out of that. That's probably like, you know, day in, day out, I'll take that uh, every yeah. time. Yeah, I find that fascinating too, that almost that interpretation and application is like, oh, wow, look what that's right. telling us, you know. Um, but that may be my problem, Jody. Let me, let me ask you what you love about being a legal data analyst or that part of your role. Yeah, so um, probably what Steve said, that, that data is a bit of a drug and what I like is watching the clients get addicted, uh, which is probably, again, sounding a little odd, but um, that a realization the awakening of wow look at what I can do look at what I've got in my hands to start with and look at what I can do with it and then the actual outcomes the the optimization of our clients as they go through a process of understanding how they can use their data to do more and more and more uh, with it every single day which is my big outcome you know this already Terry is looking for quality of life lawyers work so incredibly hard in ridiculously long hours they're very good at dotting the i's and crossing the t's and they don't know how to say no so finding ways to do more with less or actually just to do less with less um, yeah. so that they're you know not working so hard that's what I consider to be the most important part of the the legal data analytics uh, component is the outcome yeah absolutely so let me wrap in in literally the minute that we have um, by asking all of you this question and that is what is the one thing that you know absolutely for sure and that you want everyone to take away from the summit about this career as a legal data analyst and Jodie I'm going to start with you and go around the circle if I may on this so what's the one thing that you really want people to focus on communication that communication. It's, ultimately, it's about the outcome. You've got to understand what people need, what outcome they're looking for, uh, and you, it's your job to take them there through the weeds, as, as got to refer to them, and uh, and then out the other end so that there's an action point. Pretty pictures are not worth much. It's the action point that's most important. Yeah, absolutely. Steve, what are your thoughts, the key takeaway on this role? I don't want you to be scared by like some lofty technical skills, you know, anyone that's curious can come to the table and uh, willing to explore um, can become a data analyst. Yeah, absolutely. And Gotto, you're going to, you're going to close us out with your thoughts on uh, what you want folks to remember about this session. I think, yeah, the, the tools that we've mentioned, you know, it's not the beyond and all. And I think it's, it's quite apparent that, you know, I'm a lot more technical than, a lot of people in on the panel, but I don't think it's a be on and no, but at the same time, I think it is definitely a growing space within the industry. And, and if you don't go down the route of being a, a legal data analyst per se, I think there will be a time in your career where you'd be working with a, a data analyst. And so being able to understand those concepts would definitely help you in your career. Yeah, fantastic. Jody, Steve and Gotto, thank you so much for your contribution to this session. Really Really appreciate it. Huge thank you also to our audience and for those questions that you posed. They were great. If you'd like to receive updates about uh, the summit and, of course, more generally about the sort of work that we've been referring to, do please be sure to follow the College of Law and the Centre for Legal Innovation on uh, social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of the above. The other thing is that I know all of the folks on this panel are incredibly generous with their time as well as being incredibly knowledgeable and you will find all of them on LinkedIn as well. So without stalking them, but if you have a question and if we haven't been able to answer it here or if you think about it later because we know that lots of questions bubble up uh, later, I know that they would be open to you reaching out to them as well. So again, Jody, Steve, Goto, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you everyone again for attending. Bye. For having us. Thank you for having Thanks, us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.